We have another day, another battle. Today, January 29th, 2008, the New Hampshire House Education Committee visits CACR, or Constitutional Amendment Concurrent Resolution 21, providing the local political subdivision responsible for public education shall have the power to determine curriculum, set standards, and determine funding. Thank you, Madam Chairman, very much. Uh, sincerely, this isn't uh, totally at Windmills Part 2, but um, I consider this an enormously important bill. Uh, and uh, and for, I, for that reason, well, I mean, I am not one of those people that considers my job to run around dictating policy in the Education Committee. I'm very interested in education, and so I sit over there and listen to people's proposals. Uh, on the other hand, this one, I, I found this uh, move on account of Claremont quite alarming, and I will just simply uh, lay out what I'm thinking briefly. For over 200 years, the citizens of uh, our state have borne the burden and enjoyed the advantages of local control for public education. For much of that time, the legislature, representing all the people, and all those educational districts representing, I'm sorry, has extended more or less aid as needed. At this time, despite being outspent and outtaxed by other states, and even through occasional problems like Claremont, we have managed to remain at the very top of the states educationally, well ahead of most of those who have given up local control. Although our Supreme Court has consistently found education in New Hampshire to be inadequate, Last April, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's annual education report card ranked New Hampshire third in nationwide education quality. The number one and two states in the survey are also locally controlled. Of states with centralized state systems of education, the most infamous, uh, California ranked 43rd and actually ranked itself 48th of the 50 states. So why would we willingly give up local control? I've also reviewed the NEEP testing data, and believe me, that's tough to do. <laughs> and found a remarkable disparity between centrally controlled and locally controlled states. Uh, if my calculations are correct, and they are somewhat supported by other reading I've done, but I tried to do it with some original looking, uh, the difference in eighth grade math proficiency alone is over 10 percentage points. More than half of the centrally controlled states scored below the national average. On the other hand, all but one of the locally controlled states scored above the national average. The 10 worst states in eighth grade math are all centrally controlled states, while seven of the top 10 are locally controlled. In math proficiency, the 10, uh, I'm sorry, no, that, uh, the, the numbers break out very similarly in the fourth grade math testing and show the same tendencies in the reading test. So, for me, the $64,000 question, the question for this policy-making education committee of the state of New Hampshire is, what effect will centralizing education in Concord have on education quality? Will we continue to compete, or will we go with the money and let education quality in New Hampshire slide into a muddy California cellar? Are we actually playing a kind of Russian roulette with our kids' futures? <clears throat> this year, it appears the governor and legislature will implement the New Hampshire State Court's 1993 order, an order that decreed a statewide, a single statewide curriculum, accountability to politicians in Congress over parents and local school boards, with the majority of funding coming from the state, not local taxes. On the heels of that decision, the Shahid administration set the Department of Education to the task of planning a statewide curriculum. And now this past summer we find Commissioner Tracy in the papers talking about the takeover of teacher contracts and what would appear to me at least to be a direct violation of Article 6. The glaring fact is that this court-ordered centralization of education in Concord will prevent local school boards from setting the best curriculum. It will end their contracting with teachers for the teachers they choose and it will further erode local school boards and parental input. 
unless we insert the above language into our Constitution, the language on the text of the, uh, of the bill, the legislature will assume the responsibilities presently held by school boards. Again, this in the face of the fact that locally controlled schools, on average, significantly outperform such a control groups. To ameliorate the likely educational losses, I brought CACR 21 to make a local control of constitutional rights. Regardless of what the legislature and the governor may decide with respect to the defining of adequacy or the funding of education, it seems imperative to me that when the dust settles, we retain local control of our local schools. To scrap such a successful system of education, to me, seems a foolish step toward mediocrity. Thank you very much. Questions from the committee. I have one question um, on line five. The legislature shall have the power to provide supplemental funding and to determine the amount and allocation of these state funds. Would you characterize that as targeted aid? Of course. Yes. Representative Anderson, I'm wondering what this single statewide curriculum is that you're referring to. Well, I am referring only to the fact that uh, we found that the Shaheen administration was talking about it and actually saying they were going to create one. So I'm assuming that when you go to centrally controlled uh, uh, <coughs> education, you would do that as a matter of efficiency or whatever. Once you have the money, once you actually pay the money, the state will certainly be, be the entity uh, controlling whatever. We, we do that as a matter of responsibility. We control what happens to the money, don't we? Representative Carson. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and thank you, Representative Ingridson. Would you call the governor's initiative, uh, not the governor's, excuse me, the uh, commissioner's initiative of Follow the Child a state dictated curriculum? I, I try to think of getting into that. I was confused what I'm trying to do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Representative, have you found um, in your discussions with other communities that they are supportive of wanting that kind of local control back? Actually, what I've found is that everybody wants the money. And they believe somehow it's not going to come from them, but it's going to come from somebody else. So what's new around here? <laughs> Frankly, I don't think it's a good deal, but we probably will buy the money because we seem to always do that. You said something about the, s the state school board or do you, somebody wants to take over teacher contracts? Yeah. Well, I was in the newspapers this past summer that uh, Tracy was working on a statewide teacher contract. I, I didn't make it up. I, I just assumed that it's part and parcel with a move away from local control uh, dictated by Claremont. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, uh, Representative Mercy. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Paul Mercy. I was a member of the House for 10 years. Uh, uh, I served on the judiciary and fishing game for the other committee. This subject, uh, oh, I live in Enfield. Yeah. What, what I think uh, we've all been, uh, we've all wrestled with in this legislature since 1997, December 17th of 1997, which is when the Claremont decision, second Claremont decision was issued, has been money. And in that entire period of time, uh, there was never any discussion about the other half of what the court said, which had to do with actual driving the edu educational policy of New Hampshire. So we spent pretty much every year up to the present year talking about who was going to get how much money from the state. Uh, what the Claremont decision, first decision, actually said was that the state should provide guaranteed funding of an adequate education for every educable child. That means the state should provide the education and guarantee the funding of an education. It didn't say the state should provide the money and guarantee the funding of the money. 
It said the state shall be the originator of whatever constitutes an adequate education. It shall provide that education. And then it shall provide the funding for that education. It said both things in the same sentence. And then it repeated that again in Claremont too. And it's been a consistent theme through all the various decisions. So while we focused on money, we've been sort of waiting for the next shoe to drop, which is what happens once we provide the money. As anyone knows, he who pays the piper plays the tune. The first part of that sentence, the providing the education will become a theme for the next, once we get past this money part. The money issue is kind of booming now ahead. That became a pretty alarming uh, thought for me. And most of the time, the last 10 years, like everybody else, I was focused on the money too. Taxes, the implication of taxes, what we do to my own school district, what we do to the state's coffers, and all that kind of stuff got caught up in that. And then I began to think about what, what statewide control of education would mean. And it became fairly disturbing to think about that. My, uh, just to give you a little background, my wife uh, taught third grade for 35 years. And uh, some of you will be surprised, particularly Republicans, she was also the president of the local NEA for 10 years. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, she had some, <laughs> so she had, she had a pretty good feeling for uh, where teachers were, the subject of what goes on in classrooms. And I used to get a lot of this uh, discussion sort of in the course of evening dinners. And while I was here, I didn't vote on anything having to do with money and education because it was money in my pocket. I thought it was a conflict of interest, but I had a pretty strong interest in the subject. My, my wife was one of those teachers who uh, were, quite frankly, pretty spectacular. And as edicts over 35 years came down, a change in the way she operated in her classroom, she eventually began to ignore them and ignore them and ignore them until toward the last 10 years of her teaching life. She pretty much, pretty much closed the door of the state and uh, a lot of the directors because she produced great results in the classroom. And the district didn't want to get very close to her because she produced great results. But her principal complaint, and the complaint that she always related to me, had to do with the degree to which the state became involved in her activities in the classroom. And the degree to which most of the activities, if you carry them to the proper, to the logical extreme, would produce a poor quality experience for the kids she taught. We know, as Representative Ingerson told you, that when you look at uh, education studies nationwide, that wherever states control and drive the education curriculum is poorer than where communities drive their own education curriculum. Why is that? Because local communities have parents who are in the classrooms. They go bother the school board, they drive the school board crazy. And eventually, they're able to kind of keep, keep an interest, they, they, they keep an interest up on, on the quality of the kids, uh, of education kids receive in the classroom. So, you have to ask yourself, is why if we score so well nationally as a state, Number three, as Representative Emerson mentioned, we always are in the top ten in scores. Why would you want to change and move for some other system which in every, I mean, it's impossible to imagine how going to a central system will improve education in Hampshire. You have to ask your policy committee, you have to ask yourself that question. If we're going to adopt the rest of the Claremont idea, which is to provide the state will provide the education, how will we guarantee we can't do it. So I'm here to support from CSTR 21. Uh, I think that, oh, I, this amendment really doesn't affect the funding whatsoever. It just simply speaks to the control of uh, the curriculum standards at the local level. So the state is still free and the state is still required under the balance of the Claremont decision to go and fund it to the degree that the court says. But it does say that ultimately, the final decision about what goes on class goes on classrooms will occur within the class within the district. And that district will be the final arbiter. I would say to those of you who uh, would have some some sort of skepticism, perhaps you might think about all the controversy over No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind is a program which is really imposed on local districts through the state. If you don't like No Child Left Behind, you gotta support this amendment because ultimately the school district itself will decide the degree to which government at any, at any level could uh, uh, affect the quality of education in the local classroom. So I urge you strongly to support this bill, this uh, CACR, and I would certainly hope you would come to, would recommend this passage. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And thank you for your testimony. As I look at the um, previous question that was asked about the possibility of poverty matters, could this also allow the state not to pay any money and then get all of the local district to make those with all the determinations? I don't think so because Claremont still is in effect. The rule still says, I mean, it does, this doesn't affect the Claremont decision whatsoever with respect to funding. So if you, uh, if you're going to continue to deal with a funding issue, as you are doing now, you now have an obligation to provide something to whatever degree the legislature decides, and you're in the process of figuring that out, you will do it. It doesn't remove any of that whatsoever. No. Thank, Thank you. For your testimony, um, Paul Pam Ian, followed by Howard Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Pam Ian, and I am a public school teacher here in New Hampshire. I've been here for about 11 years now. Um, and I, I just want to tell you about my experience in New York State, where I was also a teacher for many years. And my decision to move to New Hampshire was based on a lot of the things that I saw wrong with New York State. And, and as was testified before, New Hampshire, when I looked into it back in 96, New Hampshire had one of the highest rating for SAT scores in the nation. And that was part of the reason why I decided to move here. Um, in New York State, there is more control by the state over everything from curriculum to money, how much is spent per capita per child. New York State does spend a lot more per capita per child. However, I can tell you as a teacher, I do not see any difference in the classroom between what actually happens in New York State and what happens here in New Hampshire where there is less per capita. If anything, I think the students here in New Hampshire are much more receptive to education. I've had less behavior problems. I've had less uh, failures. I've had less uh, students that don't do their homework than I ever did when I taught in New York. And I think this attests to your climate here in New Hampshire, and I'm so glad that I moved here, because educationally it is one of the best systems in the nation, and I fully support CACR 21. I think it clarifies uh, what should happen, is that the local school district should make the decisions. And also as a parent, and a grandparent, and a teacher, I think it's important. Because if I have a problem, my children went to Concord School District. If I have a problem with what's being offered there, <coughs> I go to the school board, or I, I become a member of the PTA, and I feel like I have a lot more say. And I realize sometimes it's hard for people to get involved with things, but if you're a parent, it is your obligation to get involved in your children's education. And I think that's where the power should be with the, with the local districts. Um, also in New York, I wanted to point out, I'm using New York because that's the one I know the best. In New York, where they do spend a lot more and it is more centralized, you're never going to get equality. The district I grew up in, I would have to say it's probably economically um, <coughs> lower middle class to maybe middle middle class. And we offered four foreign languages for our students. I, I went to school in this district and that was the first district that I taught in. The neighboring district where I later started to teach, the economics was lower middle class. A lot of transient students, a lot of students from New York City were there. Uh, they only offered two languages. And I, I started a German program, but when I left there, the German program went by the, the wayside. So what I'm saying is you can still have a state where they spend so much and they tax so much and they control so much, and you're never going to get that equality that everyone says is lacking here in New Hampshire. Well, Concord does offer four languages. That was part of the reason when I moved to, to New Hampshire. My sons both wanted to take German. One of them was thinking of Latin, the other was also thinking of Spanish, so I chose that district. The district where I teach right now, we only offer Spanish and French, and then I teach um, German as an elective program. So as I'm saying, there's no difference, and I just don't think that we should be changing our, uh, our way of educating our kids when we've had so much success so far. And I want to leave you with, with two things that, that uh, struck me. With the state control and certain things in education, when I first came here, there was a big snowstorm. I think it was the first year I was teaching. And the kids were already in school. And the principal said to me, we're probably going to dismiss early. 
because of the snowstorm. And I'm looking at the snow piling up outside. And I said, oh, okay, we're, we're going to leave at 11 o'clock? And she said, no, by law, we have to wait till lunch is over. We're not leaving till 1. And it was 9.30 in the morning. I'm saying, blazes, by the time 1 o'clock rolls around, it's going to be impossible to get out of here. Why don't we just dismiss, you know, let the next class, you'll have two classes taught, let's dismiss. So that's one example. The other, other example is educational. Um, the way the state tests students, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but students are actually taken out of the classroom. So they're losing classroom time, and they're given these state exams, whether it be the NEAPs, the NECAPs, and I know that No Child Left Behind probably has a lot to do with some of this, but this was done even before No Child Left, left Behind. It would be more rational to me, rather than have a state mandate that says kids are taken out of class to be taught, I mean to be assessed, why don't they make it a final exam for that content-specific course? In other words, one thing New York State does do that I agree with, they have the Regents exams, and that's the state test. So when I finish my chemistry class, instead of having the teacher made final, we take the state final. It's called a Regents exam. Do the same thing with a lot of the other subjects. That way the kids are not losing any any classroom time. And if you gave, if I was able to sit down with my superintendent and explain this to him, he might say, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, why don't we work for something like that for the state rather than do it the way the state's doing it right now. So I just, I just want to make you aware of those two facts there. Questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Itzy, I, I received your card after I called Mr. Wilson. That's fine. That's fine. It's a public hearing. He's a member of the public. <laughs> Thank you. For the record, my name is Howard Wilson. I have been a member of the Board of Selectmen in the town of Andover a couple times, so I've had at least a peripheral point of consideration wrestled with this semi-problem. What we have here is something that almost returns us back to what Claremont II disrupted. But, and thankfully, it does provide the access to at least some, if needed, money. And for all of me, this is the best for the moment, piece of legislation, I hope it's the final moment of legislation, to be considered to get away from what we are tending towards at the moment, which is a state overweening control with a, a definition that can't really be defined with money. Take the money out, you can do fine. Add money to it, and you're going to continue wrestling for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I think CACR 21 has merit all over the place. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And if you have written testimony oh, yeah. here to pass up to the court, we yep. appreciate that. Thank you very much. Other questions? Thank you again. Yep. Uh, Representative Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, I'm Representative Dan Itza. I represent Rockingham County District 9. Uh, I rise in strong support of CACR 21. Um, it does something that's very important. Our Constitution is divided into two parts. It's part one, which is the Bill of Rights, and I like to say that it provides a skeleton uh, of our government. Part two is the form of government, and it provides the muscle, the energy, to carry out part one. Education has a dedicated uh, article in part one. It describes, at least to some degree, what education is supposed to look like in this state. And I think that our founders were somewhat remiss in not giving something that was enumerated in part one, some uh, specific direction in part two as to how it was supposed to play out. Because it did, it did speak, uh, article one, uh, part, art, part one article six, originally spoke to 
the distribution of responsibility between the state and the towns. Uh, it uh, clearly stated that the legislature had the authority to authorize schools, that's to create them and to accredit them. Uh, we've taken that away in 1968. And I think we ought to put it back. I'll be talking to you about that next week. Um, it also clearly said that the towns were uh, uniquely responsible for funding the schools. And if you look at the laws that were uh, enacted immediately subsequent, the legislature said the town shall raise, I think it was uh, four pounds for every 20, uh, for the schools for every 20 shillings that they raised to the state. So we, they had a, a definite uh, perspective as to what the Constitution meant uh, in regard to funding and uh, curriculum and all those kinds of things. Uh, and I think it is, it is very important that we give some, some direction to people have to, who have to consider this issue in the future. And I think CACR 21 is absolutely uh, the best articulation of the distribution of, of responsibility between the state and the towns. Representative Reaver, just curious. Mm -hmm. I have a thank you. I find myself curious, and I have a feeling you would have the answer. What would, if in fact you did? raise four pounds for every 20 shillings. <laughs> <laughs> I have not the slightest idea. <laughs> I was actually sure. <laughs> no, I have not bothered to try and, and go back and look at the value of silver. I mean, cause that, and, and what a shilling was relative to a pound. So, I'm sorry. Representative Rubik. For a quick answer, there are 20 shillings to a pound. <laughs> <laughs> it's about $3,500 per student. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, excuse me. I, I Good answer, Rick. <laughs> 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 Thank you for your testimony, Representative. Um, we'll call Ken Blevins. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the committee. My name is Ken Blevins. I come from Bowen, New Hampshire. Um, I, um, I would like to address CACR 21 a little bit differently. And, you know, what we're trying to do, you people as the Education Committee and, and the legislature and local control, we're trying to educate our, our children. And we're trying to educate our children in the way our forefathers seen our country. And I believe nobody can deny that our forefathers were looking toward freedom. Now, if you put the education issue on a state level, are you representing to the children individual freedom and individual rights? Or are you representing to them a movement towards a socialized form of life. By controlling education on the state level, you can only have one result. And that is everyone is moving towards equality on the state level. I believe our children deserve more than that. I'd like to say that I'm sitting here representing the children, which nobody else has done. And how do we want to educate our children? I believe we want to educate them towards freedom, towards individual responsibility. And by putting the education system on the state or federal level, with no child left behind, if you will, aren't you really encouraging them to, to form socialist ideas, to move away from the freedom that this country was you know, blessed with by our forefathers? That's why I'm in favor of CRCA 21. It has nothing to do with control. It has everything to do with putting freedom in the hands of the children that we're trying to teach. Teach them what freedom is about. It's, it's a direction. It's a direction that I believe that, that would be best for the community, 
and for the state and, and for the United States as a whole to get back to the point that you have to have individual responsibility and, and individual commitment. And by moving education on a state level, you're really destroying this in our children. Bring back the freedom that everybody is looking for. Let our children, if you will, be diversified, compete. Sure you're gonna have winners, sure you're gonna have losers. Sure you're gonna have rich, sure you're gonna have poor. But that's what made this country. That's basically why I'm here and why I support CR 21. Thank you for your testimony. Are there questions Seeing none, thank you again for coming in today. Um, Dr. Mark Joyce. Madam Chairman, my name is Mark Joyce. I'm here today representing New Hampshire school administrators as well as New Hampshire special education administrators. I'm here in opposition to CACR 21 for several reasons. First of all, I believe it's counterproductive to the interests of children in our state. And secondly, I believe it has uh, significant unintended consequences for school districts, for children, and for taxpayers. We have consistently supported the proposition that public education is a right, a constitutional right of every child in every community. And as a result, we support the decisions of the Supreme Court in both the Claremont cases and the Londonderry cases that reaffirm that right and assign the appropriate role to the legislature to define adequacy, to come up with a system that has a cost and a distribution method and to ensure its delivery to all children. We believe the state has made significant progress in that regard, uh, much to the hard work of people in this room. We have our definition. We are approaching a cost of that. We believe that it's very possible for us to come up with a workable solution that ensures that delivery to every child in every community. Now that does not preclude the fact that the state system can target resources to those in greater need in addition to those of basic universal adequacy. We think that is fundamental to provide a basis for all children to move forward in their education systems. This bill and others like it that seek to limit the court's oversight and to enhance the legislature's sole authority to determine funding has significant unintended consequences. It would no doubt embroil the debate about appropriate education funding to every legislative session. Depending on the interests present, the majorities available, those weights would change. At stake here, right now, is well over $1 billion in aid that flows from the state to your local school districts. That comes in the form of adequacy aid, as well as in the form of building aid, catastrophic special ed aid, in this bill, and others like it, leave that authority for discretionary supplemental funding solely in the hand of the legislature. That would create significant, I believe, unintended consequences in our school districts, for our children, and for your taxpayers. So for those reasons, I remain in opposition to this constitutional amendment and wholly support the legislature's work to fully fund and distribute the resource necessary. Thank you for your testimony. Questions for the Representative Craig. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I, I think what I'm hearing from you is that the the state should be the the final arbitrator. Um, but do you support the concept of local control that's in the, in the bill? I mean, it, it doesn't seem as if if your statement leads me to that conclusion. I certainly support the appropriate controls locally. What I was speaking to in terms of the state being an arbiter, really I wouldn't use that word. I think the state constitution, as interpreted by the legislature's actions and the oversight of the Supreme Court, is protecting a fundamental right of all children. That is what I support. Thank you. 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 Th
I think that's a real and valuable right, and that the state has an important role to provide that basic assistance. On top of that, you have heard me this week speak to you before about unfunded mandates that go beyond the authority of the legislature and usurp the local control. Totally support that. But in the nature of this basic constitutional right, I think that is what CACR 21 is addressing. I, I, well, there's a follow-up, but I don't know how to phrase it. <laughs> because I don't think you can have it both ways. I mean, either there's local control or there isn't. I, I can't phrase my follow-up, but... If that was a question, I would attempt a response to say that um, I think you can have it both ways in the sense that each has their range of authority. That the state has a policy and role and a function that's appropriate for the state, federal government does for the federal government, the location for their own political subdivision. Um, and what I support is appropriate funding for each of those obligations. So for the state's obligation, it should be funded. For the federal obligation, it should be funded, or they shouldn't be able to usurp that local control. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I apologize for being working. Right. What? How's the chainsaw? Oh, great, <laughs> wonderful, thank you. Um, wonder, wondering if this were to pass and the four towns in the state did not receive supplemental funding from the state and they were at such a disadvantage, what would start happening to those towns and those communities throughout the state? So I think you'd have an increasing disparity of opportunity for the kids. Uh, if we were to take the extremes from uh, the very poorest, of, by all measure, equalized valuation as well as income, and those at the opposite end, you would just see those drive uh, totally oppositional in their success, both in performance and their ability to offer opportunity. I think what's at stake here, and what perhaps the Londonderry case pointed out, is you have a huge moderate population that is highly dependent on predictable state aid for the directives that they give. And uh, that was proven, I think, in the plaintiff group that is represented by London Dairy. There are many communities that people there know they're not rich, but yet they're considered to be so-called wealthy. They have a real stake in this issue. And if their aid dis diminishes, goes to zero, they would be significantly impacted by that. So it's not just the extremes. It's throughout that continuum that there would be a negative impact. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to train it. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, actually I actually have two questions on that. One is that you mentioned an unintended consequences that the legislature will be continuously looking at this issue, but hasn't haven't we already been involved in that little uh, that little hamster wheel already? Aren't we already continuing looking at this issue? And the second question I have is that if we are to ever, uh, why, why would a community ever decide to support education uh, at any level if they knew that all they have to do is fall below a certain level and the state is going to pick up the tab? Um, I believe the court's oversight has helped motivate the legislature to act in a more consistent manner. <coughs> we did have a funding plan that was arguably constitutional for a number of years before the most recent substitute plan came in. Absent that kind of oversight, I think it would definitely happen annually. And your second question is, but well, we're looking at kind of reverse incentive to where a community give up. You know, I firmly believe that our citizens really believe in public education as a public good. I think more likely what they would do is clamor for assistance if necessary. They would come here today and talk to you about their needs. Because I think everybody, whether they're a senior citizen or a parent or a young uh, adult, all support public education and want to offer that. The question is, do they have enough resource to do it? Uh, I'm Dean Mitchner, here representing the New Hampshire School Boards Association in opposition to this bill. The School Board Association has and does support the findings of the Claremont lawsuit. 
Uh, we participated in that case. This amendment would open the door to a challenge of those principles that determine the case, and it would allow the legislature to set funding levels at its whim or even step away entirely. While we currently have standards for school approval, local districts already have the autonomy and local control to set curriculum and standards within those guidelines. And school district meetings are the ultimate form of local control where the community adopts the budget. Yes, there are state requirements as to the minimum levels of support that those budgets must uh, address. But along with those standards comes a requirement that the state participate in funding the educational program. The proposed amendment and others similar to it would undercut those principles and not hold the state to any standard or minimum level of funding support. We do not support this proposal, and we have historically not supported any such attempts to undermine the state's commitment to providing an adequate education for all children. Historically, we, the school board association at our annual delegates assembly has adopted resolutions calling for a solution to the funding crisis that is consistent with the spirit of Claremont Foundation, for solving the funding issue in a fair and equitable manner with the money so raised being distributed to local school districts and a resolution opposing attempts to downshift state costs and burdens to local districts. And if that is not enough, we addressed the issue again just about two weeks ago in, our in this year's Delegate Assembly, where we uh, adopted a resolution that opposed any attempts to vacate the spirit and intent of the Claremont and Londonderry lawsuits. Uh, we hope that you find this proposal in speaking to legislation. Questions for Mr. Mitchell? Well, I, I would like to know if you have a definition of local control then, since you're from the School Boards Association. A definition of it? Yes. I, I think I tried to portray that right now. We do have state minimum standards, but within those guidelines, local districts adopt curriculum to meet the specifications but we have the autonomy and local control to adopt specific curriculum and standards at our local level. We also have our school district meetings where we can adopt, where we can choose to fund or not fund new programs or pieces of that, of that budget. As was all, already mentioned, we do believe that there is a federal commitment and we constantly are seeking to increase funding levels and support for what we believe was promised to us in federal funding in the area of special education. We do believe that the state has a commitment to providing an adequate education for all children, and we have supported that, and we look to those funds to help us as we implement programs at our local level. We do believe that within those guidelines, we are adopting curriculum and standards that we have, over which we have control and what we are determining best at the local level. Further, further questions? Um, but we, as the legislature, just said that children have to stay in school till they're 18. That's taken that issue totally out of local control. That's true. That's part of that's part of state law and state minimum standards. We don't have the ability to say you, um, that you can drop out at 16 when that. Uh, given that passage of that law. But along with that um, passage of that law came about a 500% increase in dropout and prevention money, came expansion of regional programs to address at-risk students. So there was funding associated with the implementation or what we see as implementation uh, for programs that will specifically address those at-risk students that was the focus of that bill. Oh. But local people had no control over that. I mean, we made the decision here legislatively. Yes, the, the legislature passed the law, and we have to abide by the law. The legislature passes many laws that we have to abide by. Representative Remington, thank you very much. Remember, we're asking questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell, would you believe that we have a form of local control in the fine print so that uh, 
age 18 bill, which in fact allows the parents to go to the superintendent school board to get their child out of school earlier. To me, is that a form of local control? Um, I would agree with your assessment. Part of that process was a revision to the minimum standards that provided a lot more flexibility in how we address educational programs to meet the needs of certain students. And with uh, local approval programs, a non-in-school setting can be used as an alternative program providing an, an education plan that leads to a diploma. So in that sense, yes, I would agree with that. And is not the New Hampshire legislature the most locally elected I would submit that this citizen legislature truly does personify. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mitchner. Um, Representative you. Christensen, um, I, I welcome this note that says you will speak for two minutes because we are running late. Well, nothing new. I've got a few pages to get to. Uh, I can give you an outline and then we'll Whoops, I need one. Give me one back. <laughs> the first um, page, we'll just hit quick, you know, but the page under two minutes is telling the purpose of this. Uh, got to get the, the courts out of this. Okay, and that's the, uh, it was off the internet and uh, what I put together for that. The second one is uh, the Hudson School Board. I'm a, a representative. I remember the Hudson School Board since 1995. Um, and uh, this is their uh, position on the kindergarten paper. Okay, They made a press relief, release. And you have uh, a different opsy in the southern part of the state. You have these private kindergartens and uh, they're going to pull a 28 issue on and they can send enough so they can subcontract. You know, we can have a private school just like they got in Derry. You know, uh, I think it's in the academy. Uh, and then the last one was in last night's school board meeting. Talking about the lawsuits and all this squibbling is going to do is make it so that the lawyers are going to keep coming back and Settle the arguments. I've had legislative service on the law. Oh, geez, fourth edition of a bill. And he's saying, oh, you're denying judicial review. I said, look, I want to write it so simple, calm, and law, understandable like a constitution. Okay? I don't want to have to make it so that both parties have to hire a lawyer in order to figure out what it means. Okay? And the last page is talking about various issues, 28A issue again. So let's, I, I got nothing against lawyers, but I don't like to spend tax made money for it. Pass this, by all means. Let's get on with it so we can educate our kids. As far as special needs and so on, we do well. Okay, you can check our record as far as Hudson School are concerned uh, uh, in their assessments and so on. And uh, the taxpayers want to do the best for the kids. And local control is what we want. We don't need the state taking over education. We don't need the courts. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives the court any authority. Enough said. Let's pass this bill. Thank you, Representative Christensen. Um, and finally, Mr. Rick Twelve. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, it might sound funny, but I agree with uh, like all the prior speakers except for where I disagree with them. And uh, what I mean by what I mean by that is, um, in all honesty, that that. Um, Many of the, the speakers supporting this uh, constitutional amendment, I agree with them relative to local control and, and the duties of the cities and towns to do what they're supposed to do. And, and um, the arguments they made. Uh, I remind, I don't know where the state of local control stands in New Hampshire because I think all of you remember about 10 years ago, um, we put an amendment before the voters. I was in the Senate, I chaired the committee that pushed the amendment through, giving local control to the cities and towns amending the Constitution to literally give local control. That's what the amendment said, and the voters rejected it. It was defeated. I don't even think it got a majority of votes. 
So ever since then, I've sort of scratched my head about where the people in New Hampshire really stand with um, with local control and, and what they're going to do with it. But be that as it may, the NEA New Hampshire, Rick Crombie, so speaking for the NEA New Hampshire, and, and we firmly support local control in education. and education. We, we opposed uh, No Child Left Behind because of, of what it did at the federal level to the state. Um, we passed the hate crimes in this legislature. We, su we supported, and that gave local control the school boards to come up with a plan dealing with, with hate crimes. You know, we spoke last week about a sex education bill that, that we wanted to keep local control uh, there. You're going to hear a bill next week, which is very important to us, dealing with the non-renewable teachers, where our position is going to be that the state should interfere in contracting and should allow local control. So we've been we've been absolutely consistent on that. Um, but the problem here is I don't think it's a matter of, of what the, the court did because we've always supported Claremont. What, what bothers me or confuses me is, is the idea that, that um, our good friends who argue a constitutional basis for uh, overturning Claremont or want to amend the Constitution forget the fact that our forebearers set up a three-part government. Now, this constitutional amendment seeks to take the courts out of of the review process. And yet, our forebearers, if we're going to go back to their logic in dealing with government, whether or not the court even had the right to do it, there's no argument that the, the courts were established under the Constitution. So if you're going to argue what the forebearers did, then you can't come to the log logical conclusion that you can sit and pick as the legislature what you're going to let the courts review and what they're not going to review. That was established by the brilliance of our, our forebearers. I just want to say that uh, the problem with this bill uh, that I'm going to address here is uh, the part dealing with uh, the legislature's ability to give additional funding. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Uh, you, you've served. You've been around. That number will very shortly be zero. That number will go down. The legislature never fully funded Augenblick, and there's no requirement to do that. You have a prior history of this legislature, not this particular session, but prior legislators breaking its promise time and time and time again to the people of the state. The rooms and meals tax, money was supposed to go back to the cities and towns, 60-40. Eventually it was 90% of the state, 10% of the cities and towns. The business enterprise wasn't tax wasn't supposed to go up. Guess what? It went up, it was increased. They've changed the business profits tax. Temporary taxes become permanent taxes. Folks, this legislature has absolutely no consistency and no idea what it's going to be doing when it comes to taxation. But it does know one thing. When it needs money, it takes away from the people, the cities and towns, and it takes away from education. Don't forget, folks, that when this legislature had the authority, it was four years ago, to change the funding mechanism for Claremont. You know, you know what the legislature did then? They passed a funding bill where Hollis and Bedford got more money and every single plaintiff town lost money. I don't trust the legislature, Madam Chair, to do what's right for the children in this state. If you give them this authority, I think it's a death knell for public education. <coughs> I'm done. Questions from the committee, huh? Of course, that didn't pertain to any of you. <laughs> Thank you very much you. for your testimony. Um, and that closes the hearing on CACR 21. Thank you all for coming in today. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. If you don't like no child left behind, you'll support this matter. The taxpayers want to do the best for the kids. And local control is what we want. We don't need the state taking over education. We don't need the courts. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives the court any authority. Enough said. Let's pass this bill.